Hallelujah. Well, as I mentioned before, today we're going to be talking about the communion elements. I'm going to be talking to you about the secret that God has for us, the secret for, to divine health and healing for the believer, the secret to divine health and healing. Now, before we talk about the communion, I want to make sure that we have a proper foundation as to how we ought to think regarding sickness and disease and how we're supposed to think about divine health and healing. Uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, I made this statement. I said that as human beings, we, all of us, we were made by love, with love, and in love, right? God is love. We were made by God, and we were made in God, and we were made with love, with God, all right? Uh, uh, when God decided to make us, he said that, we are go that, that we're going to be made in his image and in his likeness. Now, when God created us, he did not intend for you and I to experience sickness and disease. In fact, he never even intended for us to experience death the way human beings experience death. It was never part of the plan. And therefore, when you open your Bibles to the book of Genesis and you see the creation story, you see Adam and Eve, they were enjoying the presence of God. They, they did not have headaches. They did not have uh, any kind of viruses attacking their body. They lived in a, a place of divine health and healing. But however, we see pain, sickness, disease, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, malfunctions in the physical body begin to take place in a human being only after the fall. Only after the disobedience of Adam and Eve did human beings begin to experience sickness and disease in their bodies. So here's one of the things I want you to understand. Throughout Scripture... Sickness is always associated with the curse, right? Sickness is always associated with the curse. And health and healing is always associated with the blessing. Sickness is associated with the curse. It is associated with the fall of Adam and Eve, with the fall of humanity. Health, life, healing... Divine health, divine life, divine healing, all of it is always associated with the blessing of God upon a person's life. With the blessing or with the God's original intent and God's original plan for every single one of us. We see this throughout Scripture. Even though we see this throughout Scripture, unfortunately, even from a religious perspective or a, a, a church perspective or a religious perspective, what has happened is we've, there has been a twisting of the Word of God. There's been a twisting of the Word of God where we have begun to think that somehow sickness and disease is part of God's plan for certain people. And I'm going to show you today from Scripture that it is absolutely not God's plan. It is absolutely not God's will. It is absolutely not God's desire that anybody be sick. Just like it is not God's desire that anybody live in sin. Just like it is, God, it is not God's desire that anybody should perish. It is absolutely not God's desire that anybody be sick or suffer with sickness and disease in their physical bodies. Amen? Now, go with me to Psalms 105, please. Psalm 105. I just want to lay a quick foundation of how we see the supernatural and how we see the heart of God even in the Old Covenant. All right? Psalm 105. Now, many of you already know that the children of Israel were in uh, slavery and bondage in, the, in Egypt. And once they were uh, rescued by God or delivered from the hand of the, uh, uh, the pharaohs and from the hand of the Egyptians, they now came out of that land and now they were on their way to the promised land. Psalm 105 and verse 37 says this. He says, He also brought them out with silver and gold, and there was none feeble among his tribes. Now think about it. This is several millions of people coming out of slavery, coming out of bondage, coming out of the hand of the enemy, and now they're coming out of Egypt, and now they're on their way to the promised land. Well, how did they, in what kind of condition did they come? Think about this. We're talking about a group of people who lived as slaves. 
Not as people who lived in the king's palace and ate the best food. Slaves don't eat the best food. Slaves don't live in the best conditions. That means they were doing the most horrible jobs possible in the most horrible environment and condition possible, and they were not eating the best of food, but they were probably eating the worst of food. And yet, supernaturally, the Bible says that when they were coming out of the land of Egypt, they came with silver and gold, and they also came with divine health and healing. There was not a single person that was sick among them. How is that possible? It is only possible by the divine supernatural provision of God. Amen? Now, go with me to Acts chapter 10, please. Acts chapter 10. In the New Testament, Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, it says, And you know the God, that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Now, what was Jesus doing? Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Healing all who were oppressed by the devil. It does not say healing all the people that God was oppressing. No, if, 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 if Jesus was healing the very people that were being oppressed by God, he would be fighting against his own father. And we know that Jesus did the will of the father. And so we have to understand and realize that everything Jesus did, he was doing by the will of the Father against the enemy. And so now he's saying that Jesus healed everybody he came in contact with, everybody that came to him in faith. He healed them, and while he was doing that, he was destroying the works of the enemy. They were bound by the devil. They were not bound by God. See, that's why sickness is always associated with the enemy. It is always associated with the devil. It is only supernatural health and healing that is associated with God. Amen? I pray that you understand that. Now, um, in the New Testament, the provision for healing, like everything else, is always found in the finished work of Jesus Christ is always found in the finished work of the cross. Okay, pastor, I understand that health and healing comes from God. I understand that even in the Old Testament that we see that, that, that when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt, it was God who healed them supernaturally and gave them divine health and healing. I understand even from the New Testament, uh, uh, pastor, that Jesus went ahead and healed people. But now Jesus is not walking around on this planet. Jesus had, is at the right hand of the Father. So how do I get healed, pastor? Well, as always, as in anything in the New Covenant, we always look to the cross. We always look to the cross because that is the, the place where Jesus finished the work that needed to be done, right? It's the finished work of Jesus. It's the finished work of the cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And this is where we're going to get right into the meat of where I want us to uh, look at. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and starting from verse 23. It says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Now, one of the things I want you to understand is, obviously, it is talking about, here Paul is talking about the, the communion elements. One of the things, religiously, a lot of people think is that the communion can only be taken when you come to church. The other thing is some, sometimes, depending on the background that you come from, there are people who think communion can only be done once a week. There are certain people who think communion can only be done once a year. There are certain people who think communion can only be done once a month. 
No, the Bible says you can do it as often as you want. You can do it on a daily basis. You can even do it multiple times in a single day. There's no restriction. However, one thing that we need to make sure is that we don't do this religiously, that we don't do it as a routine. Because one thing that Paul says is he reminds us the words of Jesus. And Jesus says, as often as you do it, do it in my remembrance. That means we don't do it religiously. We don't do it as a routine. But when we do partake in the communion elements, we always do it remembering what Jesus did. Remembering what Jesus said. And remembering what it means to you and me today. That's how you make sure that you don't do this religiously, and that's how you make sure it does not become a routine in your life. Verse 26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Now, why the Lord's death and not his resurrection? Because I would think, you know, he, he's not dead anymore. He's resurrected. So why not celebrate his resurrection? And why are we proclaiming the Lord's death? Uh, um, hold your uh, place in the Bible there and go with me to Colossians chapter 2, please. I'll tell you why we proclaim the Lord's death. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15 says, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. You see, it was through his death that he made a spectacle, that he disarmed principalities and powers, and he triumphed over them. That's the reason why we declare the Lord's death. In other words, what, what, what Paul is saying is we are declaring, every time we do this in remembrance of him, we are declaring that Jesus disarmed principalities and powers. We are declaring that he has triumphed over them, and he, we, we are declaring that he made a public spectacle of those things. Amen? All right. Go back with me to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and let's continue from verse 27. He says, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body uh, and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and let him not eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. And when the Bible says many sleep, it's talking about people dying, right? Again, it says, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you. Now, who is Paul writing to? Paul is writing to believers. He's not writing to unbelievers. He's not talking about the people in the world. He's talking about people who are Christians, and yet he says, many of you are weak and sick. Now, if we say that healing and health is God's will for us, why is it that God's children, the people of God, why is it that many are still weak and sick? Let's examine these couple of verses. Again, going back to verse 27. It says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup in cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, they will be guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus. Or blood of the Lord. Right. Now, when a lot of people read these verses, these are the verses that have caused many people not to participate in the communion. These are the verses that people uh, uh, have listened to and read. And when the communion elements are being passed in the church, they, instead of partaking in the communion elements, they just let them pass over. They just send it to the next person. Right now, but pay attention to what it is actually saying, because see, once the light of the word of God comes into your life, so once revelation comes into your life, no devil in hell can continue to do its work in your life. Amen. So let the light and the revelation of God come into your life at this time. Verse 27 again, um, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. Now, those two words, unworthy manner, have caused a lot of people to come up with religious ideas of what it means. 
And what have people normally tend to believe? They believe uh, uh, participating in the communion in an unworthy manner is, is participating in the communion when you still have sin in your life. Participating in the communion when you got uh, upset with somebody, when you said certain things that you shouldn't have said, when you saw things that you shouldn't have seen, when you behaved in ways that you shouldn't have behaved, when you know that and we think that we should not participate in the communion because that would be doing it in an unworthy manner. But is that what the verse is truly saying? Again, read it carefully. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. So he's not talking about sin in a person's life. He's saying the very act of you participating in the bread and the drink in an unworthy manner. He's talking about people who are already participating. That's like me saying, it's, it, it, you know, somebody's already having lunch, but they're eating it in an unworthy manner. In other words, they're not doing it the right way. Are you understanding that? They're not doing it with a thankful heart or a thankful attitude. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about sin here. And so again, he says, this is talking about partaking in the communion in an unworthy manner. Unworthy is treating as common meal, not understanding the significance of what Jesus did or said. How do you participate in the communion in an unworthy manner? By simply participating in the bread and in the wine or in the bread and in the juice without understanding what Jesus has done or what Jesus has said about the work that he was going to do on the cross. That's how you participate in an unworthy manner. Because look at verse 28. He goes on to say, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat. See, he's, he's not saying, examine yourself and don't eat. He's saying, examine yourself... But after you've examined yourself, eat. And what, does, what do most Christians do? They examine themselves and they don't eat. They don't participate in the communion. But is that God's intent? Is that, is, is that what Paul is saying? Absolutely not. What Paul is saying is, don't do it in an unworthy manner. What's an unworthy manner? Unworthy manner of participating in the communion is not paying attention to what Jesus has done, not realizing what Jesus has said about the, the finished work on the cross, and then just participating in it religiously like you would ha uh, participate in any other meal. That's doing it in an unworthy manner. And now he says, examine yourself. And after you have, uh, you've examined yourself... He says, eat, participate. Don't examine yourself to stay away from the communion. Examine yourself so you can participate in the communion. Are you understanding this? So he's saying examine yourself. Again, when he talks about examine, he's not talking about examining yourself regarding the sins you've committed. He's saying examine yourself and see and make sure that you're doing it in a worthy manner. What's the opposite of unworthy? It's worthy. So he's saying, don't do it in an unworthy manner. Examine yourself. And so what do you do? Examine yourself and say, hey, Ben, are you doing this as, uh, like you would have lunch or dinner? Are you eating this piece of bread and taking this juice like you would uh, uh, eat some biryani and drink some Coke? Are you doing it with that kind of attitude? Or are you doing it in a manner where you are doing it worthy of what those communion elements actually mean? Are you doing it in a worthy manner, remembering what Christ has actually done for you? That is what Paul is saying. Then he goes on to say, um, verse... Uh, let me read verse 28 again. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Verse 29. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. All right? Now, big words. Judgment. 
And so as soon as we say, all right, if you are doing it in an unworthy manner, you're calling upon yourself judgment. That's the reason why a lot of Christians say, well, it's better not to be judged by God. And so what's the best solution? Don't participate in the communion. That's the answer we've come up with. When, think about it from God's perspective. Why did God even give us the communion elements in the first place? Why did he do that? See, he's not, God is not asking for your blood. God is not asking for your body. He's provided the sacrifice. See, in the old covenant, they came with the sacrifice. Again, before the law came into picture, when, when God asked Abraham to provide the sacrifice, he was only looking for Abraham's heart and faith. Because at the end of the day, after even though Abraham brought his son, the sacrifice was provided by God. And Abraham lived before the law. He was living in a time of grace. And today we live in a time of grace. And God is not looking for your blood. God is not looking for your body. He provided the supernatural sacrifice that was needed. Now, why did he do that? Not so that you can stay away from him. He provided the sacrifice so that you can draw closer to him. And somehow we've read these verses and we've, because of our religious ideas and because we had a skewed view of who God is and because we've had a skewed view of the nature and the character and the heart of God, we somehow think that, oh, if I eat of this in an unworthy manner, I'm going to be judged by God. But is that what the scripture is saying? Read it carefully again. Again, verse 29. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner. Now again, I'm asking you the question, what is the unworthy manner? Is it sin? No. Eating and drinking in an unworthy manner is doing so while you neglect and don't remember what Christ has done. So now he says, if you neglect what Christ has done, if you do it without remembering Christ, now what happens? You are eating and drinking judgment to yourself. Pay attention. Again, if you just read judgment to yourself, you think, oh, the wrath of God, the punishment of God, what's going to happen to me? No, no, no. He's saying you're going to, you eat and drink judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now pay attention. He's saying you are calling judgment to yourself. How? Not discerning the Lord's body. You're not calling judgment to yourself because you lied to someone this week and you participate in the communion. You're not calling upon yourself judgment to yourself because you cheated somebody in a business deal and you participated in the communion. You are not calling judgment to yourself because you lied to your spouse and now you're participating in the communion. You're not calling upon yourself judgment because you saw pornography or you saw certain things that you did not see and now you're participating in the communion. That is not what the scripture is saying. He's saying you're calling upon yourself judgment because you are forgetting what Christ has done. You're forget. You're not doing it in remembrance of him and you're not discerning the Lord's body. Now, it's interesting that he does not say that you're not discerning the Lord's blood. He says, you're doing it, not discerning the Lord's body. Verse 30, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many die. I know it says many sleep, which means many die. For what reason are people weak, sick and dying? Because they're not discerning the Lord's body. Are you understanding this? Which means what's the opposite? If you discern the Lord's body, oh, please get this. If you discern the Lord's body, and if you participate in the communion in a worthy manner, which is what? Which is remembering Christ, remembering what he has done, and remembering what he has said. 
And now you discern the Lord's body and you participate in it regularly, what's going to happen? You're not going to be weak, which means you're going to be strong. You're not going to be sick, which means you're going to be healthy. You're not going to die, which means you're going to live. That means you're going to be strong, healthy, and alive. Strong, healthy, and alive. But if you participate in the communion thinking like you're just eating a piece of bread and like you're just drinking a, a, a bit, some, some juice, then now what's going to happen? You are not discerning the Lord's body, and that's the reason you are weak, sick, and eventually die. Are you getting this? Now, look at, go, go with me very quickly to Colossians, please. Colossians, chapter 1 and verse 14. What's the difference between the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus? A lot of times we just put it all together. But there's a significance between the blood and the body. Now, understand this. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14 says this. It says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Again, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Simply put, if you're taking notes, Jesus' blood equals the forgiveness of our sins. It's through the blood of Jesus that you were forgiven of your sins. Now, even in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, In Him we have redemption, through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to His riches of His grace. Again, two verses that let us know that it is through the blood of Jesus that we have the forgiveness of sins. Now, what about the body? The body, Isaiah chapter 53 and verses 4 and 5 says this. It says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes, the stripes that were laid on the back of Jesus. By his stripes, we are healed. So what's happening here? The blood of Jesus equals the forgiveness of our sins. The body of Jesus equals the healing of our bodies. Are you understanding that? Now, the Bible says, going back to uh, Corinthians chapter uh, 11 and verse 29. He says, um, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, what did the Lord's body mean to you and to me? The Lord's broken body equals your healed body. Are you getting that? Jesus' broken body equals your whole body, your healed body. Now, he's, he's saying that people are becoming weak and sick and dying because they're not discerning the Lord's body. Let me say it this way. People are getting sick or people are getting weak, sick, and dying because they're not discerning the broken body of Jesus. Are you getting that? You don't discern the broken body of Jesus. You don't discern the body that took your pain and sickness. And because of that, because you don't discern that and you have no faith in it, you're becoming weak, sick, and dying. Now again, he's not talking about the unbeliever. He's talking about the believer and I wish Paul didn't say that, but what Paul says is, for this reason, many are weak, sick, and dying. He doesn't say a few of you. He says many of you, which means just because a lot of Christians are dying does not mean it is God's will that they die. I care, but even if it is a pastor that dies, it does not 
mean God wanted that pastor to die. Please get that. Because people are dealing with pain and questions like never before today, especially in India. Believers are dealing with a lot of pain and questions like never before. And if those questions and if that pain is not brought to the Word of God, we're going to come up with our own philosophies. We're going to come up with our own answers. And it's a dangerous game to play. A very dangerous game to play. So Paul says, knowing well that he's writing to Christians, he says, many are weak, sick, and dying. But he says, here's the reason why. He says, because they're participating in the communion, not discerning the Lord's body. They're not calling upon judgment. Let me talk about judgment for a moment. In verse 20. Nine, when he says they're calling judgment to themselves, he's not talking about God's wrath or God's punishment. He's simply saying they're going to walk in the divine judgment that was already spoken of in Genesis. See, if you don't discern the Lord's body, if you don't take advantage of God's body, of God's secret weapon for you and for me, what's going to happen? You're automatically going to be affected by the curse that is in this world. See, God can provide an umbrella for you, but if you're not staying under the umbrella, you're going to get wet. Are you understanding that? It's the same thing for every single one of us. If we don't participate the way God wants us to, we're going to suffer the consequences as well. All right, go with me, uh, um, again, just to go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 again, but go up to verse 20. Verse 20, and now it says, Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's, sorry, it is not to eat the Lord's supper. Now, this is weird because in the book of Acts, we're going to see that they would come together to eat the Lord's supper. But now Paul is saying, therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. And one is hungry, another is drunk. Now he's talking about Christians. And he's saying one guy is, is not waiting for another person. He's eating selfishly. And another guy is getting drunk. Where are they getting drunk? In the prayer meeting. In the Bible study. That's where they're selfishly eating, and that's where they're getting drunk. So what is he talking about? Verse 21, for in eating, which each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. Verse 22, what? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. So what is happening here? Paul, you know, is about to talk to us about communion, but he says this before he talks about communion. Why? Because the people at that time began to participate in communion like it was just any other meal. So they would eat bread, and let's say five of us are coming together for a Bible study. I wouldn't wait for the others. I would just get hungry, and I would just finish eating all the communion bread. Another guy is thirsty, so he would take all the wine that was supposed to go to everyone else during the communion meal, and he would get drunk with all of that wine not caring about the other people. And he's saying, don't think that this is just any other meal. This is not just any other meal. You don't eat this meal like you eat other meals. You do this in remembrance of God. You do this in remembrance of the finished work of the cross. You do this in remembrance, discerning the Lord's body and discerning the blood of Jesus. Now, he only talks about discerning the Lord's body here because he's in context. He's talking about healing in the physical body. He's not talking about the forgiveness of sins here. 
Now, Paul talks about the forgiveness of sins in a bunch of other places. And nowhere does he talk about the Lord's body when it comes to the forgiveness of sin. Again, we read in Colossians and Ephesians, he doesn't say because of the broken body, now you have been cleansed of your sins. No, he says because of the blood of Jesus, you've been cleansed of your sins. But when it comes to healing, when it comes to people not becoming weak, sick, and dying, when it comes to people living strong lives, healthy lives, and, and alive in, in what God has called them to do, he now talks about discerning the Lord's body and not the blood. Why? Because this is a supernatural meal provided by God to his people. Are you understanding that? This is not something we do religiously. This is not something that we do just because we're hungry. Find me some bread. Oh, I'm thirsty. Give me some juice. That's not the point. This is a spiritual thing that we're doing. It is a supernatural meal, and it is God's idea provided by God to you and to me. Supernatural provision for us. But if we don't have faith in it, if we don't believe in it, if we don't see the communion elements for what they truly are, then we lose sight, and it becomes a religious thing that we participate in. Never fully receiving the supernatural and spiritual benefits of the communion meal. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Again, when we talk about the supernatural, I, I, I know, again, there are a lot of Christians who think, but, but pastor, this is just a piece of bread. How can a piece of bread heal, heal me of the virus? How can a piece of bread heal me of cancer? How can a piece of bread heal me of my sugar condition, my, my, my uh, uh, blood pressure issues or whatever, a headache, whatever the case may be? You, you've got to understand, and, and, and I've even uh, uh, you know, had a person say, like, just by eating, how is it going to happen? Well, think about this. Just by eating, when Adam and Eve ate something, just by them eating, what happened? See, if, if Adam and Eve could eat something God told them not to eat and experience the curse, what will happen if we eat what God tells us to eat? The opposite of the curse is going to happen. See, Adam and Eve ate something they were not supposed to and therefore experienced the curse. Well, if you and I eat what we are supposed to, we're going to experience the blessing, my friend. Are you understanding this? Now, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, verse, go with me, verse 4, please. It says, we used God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. See, human reasonings and false arguments, human reasoning will say, how can you just take a piece of bread, a loaf, or a piece of biscuit, and how can you eat that and think you will be healed? How can you drink some juice or some wine and grape juice or Coca-Cola or orange juice that's in your house, whatever liquid that you've got, and how do you think that's going to heal you of the coronavirus? How do you think that's going to heal you of the cancer? See, all of that is human reasoning and false arguments. That's why you've got to understand that you are a spiritual being, not a carnal being. You've also got to understand sickness and disease, by the way, is not just in the physical realm. Sickness and disease come from the spiritual realm. All sickness has its roots in the spirit, not in the flesh. All sickness has its roots in the spirit, and all healing has its roots in the spirit as well. All healing and all sickness has its roots in the spirit. That's why for every single time Jesus had to deal with healing, he always dealt with it in the realm of the spirit. It's always in the realm of the spirit. Curse is in the realm of the spirit. The blessing is also in the realm of the spirit spirit. And we've got to understand this. Now, again, I'm not preaching to you some new idea, my friends. This has always been the case. Go with me to Acts chapter 2. 
This has always been the case. Acts chapter 2 and starting from verse 42. It says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship and to share in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. What's happening here? The early church, they would gather together, and every time they gathered together, what would they participate in? Meals and the Lord's Supper, the communion. Verse 43, a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. You see, the, the participating of the communion was followed by signs and wonders. Why? Because they did not do it just like any other meal. They heard what the apostles had to say about the communion and participated in faith. And what happened? Uh, uh, supernatural signs, wonders, and miracles broke out in that place. Um, Let's jump down to verse 46. It says, They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. How often did they have communion? Verse 46 says, Every day. They participated in the communion every day. My friends, there's a lot to talk about, and we'll talk about it in the future, but here's what I want you to know for today. <laughs> Communion is God's answer to you and to me. The communion elements are God's answer to not only for the forgiveness of sins, not only so that you can live free from sin and guilt and condemnation, but the communion elements are also God's answer for you to live a life where you are strong, healthy, and alive. It's God's answer. 